Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, family. Good morning. If I haven't met you yet, I'm her husband. Um, <laughs> that is my name to fame. I uh, felt like she just spoke a way better message than I have, but <laughs> I'm so honored that you're here with us. At City of Refuge, we are a simple church that's seeking to call all to Jesus, to connect to a greater family, and live commissioned as kingdom citizens. We're so glad you're here with us today as we continue our time in the book of Philippians and our, and our sermon series, A Rooted Joy. And our sermon series, A Rooted Joy. And today, our sermon is called Faith for a Future Joy. What? Oh, and children. Children are dismissed. I, I'm going to get that right one day. One day. I'm just going to have a bunch of kids say, hey! And I'm be like, okay, I'm sorry. Y'all, y'all have fun. Y'all have fun in children's ministry. Uh, funny enough, our, my, the intro of my sermon is about a little girl. And it's an optimistic little girl. And I'm going to give the heads up now. Uh, I'm sorry that this is going to be stuck in your head. But the sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. Just thinking about tomorrow clears away the cobwebs and the sorrows till there's none. I love this line. It says, when I'm stuck with a day that's gray and lonely, I just stick out my chin and grin and say, oh, the sun will come out <laughs> tomorrow. So you got to hang on till tomorrow. What may come? The song of tomorrow, the song tomorrow is from the musical Annie. This tells of an optimistic orphan girl who lived in, in 1930s New York City who just longed to find her parents one day. Well, she was taken in by a billionaire, um, Oliver Warbooks, who initially brought her in as a PR opportunity, but over time grows quite fond of her. Uh, meanwhile, the orphanage head, Miss Hanning, she plots with her brother and his girlfriend to claim a reward by pretending to be Annie's lost parents. This play is still one of the leading plays on Broadway today. It, it's funny how famous and popular this is, and even critics still think, I'm going to come and hear this play and I'm going to be sick of it, but they all enjoy it. I, I think I saw somewhere on, on Business Insider where a man said he paid up to $536 to take his children to this play. And what I find, about, what I find interesting about Annie is Annie didn't have a promise about tomorrow. She didn't have no promise of why she should hold on for tomorrow, but yet she had faith and it gave her joy. I believe that's why this play is still so popular, because we all want hope for tomorrow. We want to hope that tomorrow will be better than our current circumstance, yet, if we can be honest, it's hard for us to think about tomorrow because today is so crazy. The economic climate is bearing down on all of us, especially as we think about the holidays are coming up. In America, our political climate seems to be on a freight train to hell. <laughs> For those in school, finals and projects are around the corner. For parents, the education system seems to be on the break of breaking. And in relationships, everything seems to be one post away from blowing up. How do we have faith? that the future will bring glory, that the future will bring joyful. How can we hope for tomorrow? Well, like the rest of this world, as the Christian, we have a savior who has given us faith for a future joy. He told us tomorrow is gonna be better than today. So keep looking ahead. Last week, Paul reminded the church to joyfully put their confidence only in Christ to experience authentic faith. This week we turn our attention to what this authentic faith produces and it's faith for future joy. 
As we look at this future joy where Paul is telling us to set our eyes, we're going to see because of this future joy, this faith for this future joy, we now have to focus on the object of our future joy versus our current circumstances. As we focus on him, we are called to galvanize others to follow us towards this future joy. And our faith should also give us compassion to those who don't know about his future joy. Lastly, it's ultimately meant to give us hope for a future joy. If you want to know your four points for the day, it is literally focus, galvanize, compassion, and hope. That's all four points. That way you can follow along with me as we walk through the text. Now, how do we focus? Where should our focus be? Paul picks up after giving the warning of the Judaizers that say you need Christ plus. He says, no, this is where my focus is. Verses 10 through 14. My goal is to know him. That's the goal. That if you want to know the goal of your life, the purpose of your life, know him. That's what we created for, to know him and to make him know everything. So if you're having a question, where do I go in my life? Know him. <laughs> what do I do in my life? Know him. Paul says, my goal, my focus is to know him in the power of his resurrection. This is the word. Power is dunamis, meaning explosive, the might, the very majesty or force of his resurrection. And how do we know him? Well, we get very familiar with suffering. It's a heart. It's in the text. It says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Why? Because we're being conformed to his death. To know him more, we must also embrace the hardships life gives us now. Why do we embrace the hardships that life gives us now? Because we have a savior, we have an advocate who understands everything we face right now. So now when we face hardships, we can be reminded, hold on, but my savior faced the same thing. Oh, that's what he faced for me. Hold on, my, my, my savior went through heartbreak too. Oh, that's what he faced for me. Oh, my savior was betrayed too. Oh, that's what he went through me. I get to know him and I get to experience the same power that brought him not just through life, but through death. And I get to follow after him in his likeness. Don't you know we're being conformed to look not more like us, but more like him. He's saying being conformed to death, assuming that somehow I will reach the resurrection from among the dead, meaning I have a goal and I'm hoping, I have a hope. This is the plan. I just want to get to know him better. And if that means I got to suffer to get to know him, I'm trying to get closer because I put my focus on him. I think he gave a better uh, uh, breakdown of why this is so important in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've been justified. That means we are now right before the holy God. We now have access to a relationship with the holy God. And we have also obtained access through him by faith into the grace in which we stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. He said, this is where our hope is. This is where our boast is. It's in who we get to stand before. But he didn't stop there. He says, and not only that, we also boast in our afflictions. Because we know that afflictions produce endurance. Endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. The hope will not disappoint us. Because God loves us. His love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given us, given to us. He's saying the reason we embrace the pains now is because it produces hope in us and helps us to keep going forward. Do you ever think, think your problems are actually working out for good? Or you fall a trap that I fall into and think that my pains and my momentary afflictions, this is where my focus should be. Paul is telling the church of Philippi, lift up your heads. And he's telling us today, lift up your heads. No, this is making you know him more. Set your focus on him and that sounds like an impossible task but I'm so glad Paul didn't end the verse there he goes on and says not that I've already reached the goal or I'm already perfect verse 12 through 13 
He says, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I have been taken a hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to be, to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do not do, the one thing I do for getting what is behind and reaching towards what is ahead, I pursue as my goal, the prize promise, but God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. I'm so glad Paul didn't say embrace affliction and just suck it up and get it right. He says, I, you know, I ain't perfect at that yet. My focus is start still being clarified. At that moment, Paul, in chains, it's like, even in my hardships, I don't have the perfect focus yet. Yeah, he's telling the church, lift up your head. Pursue. I, I love that. I make every effort to take a hold. Not because that's how I reach Christ, but Christ has already reached me. And he's bringing me to him. He's pulling me forward. So as I reach forward, he's pulling me in. Since I don't consider to have taken hold, but I do one thing, forgetting what is behind, reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. This is a, a, a illustration of he's running a race, and there's a bunch of hurdles, and sometimes he'll clear a hurdle, and sometimes he'll stumble, but he gets back up, and he makes sure he take off everything that's weighing him down, and he jumps again. Paul loves this illustration of running. And as a person who don't like to run, I ain't gonna lie, this illustration gets on my nerves because I'm like, Paul, I, I feel like I'm still stumbling. Even when I try to run, I catch a Charlie horse. He said, that's all right, keep going. Keep running, put your focus ahead. He tells the church of Corinth the same thing. He said, I do all of this because of the gospel so that I may share in the blessings. Remember, it's producing something. It's creating something. As we endure the hardships now, we're going to, we're going to share in this blessings. Don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only, receive, only one receives the prize? Run in such a way the prize, in, in such a way to win the prize. Now, everyone who competes exercise self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we are imperishable crowns. So I do not run like one who runs aimless or box like one who beats the air. This is a picture of shadow boxing. He's running and he's shadow boxing. He's working out his salvation. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself may not be disqualified. Paul, as he's working out his salvation, also knows he got to work this out himself as he's telling others to work it out. Um, earlier this week, for y'all that don't know, I work with the South Carolina Baptist Convention as a, a partner uh, on the church planting team, and I actually train church planters. That is a, a job I do, I'm contracted to do. I help train church planters. They bring me in, I get to encourage church planters, talk to church planners, help them think through ideals of how to move forward, even though I have not reached the mark. And this week, we had a training on endurance. And that sounds great, like, oh, cool, endurance. Until I got there and it says, yeah, the whole training is gonna be how to embrace pain. I was like, I don't like this. <laughs> I ain't come for this. And it's a couple quotes that still stick out in my mind. You know, one was like, if you're not bleeding, you're not leading. I was like, wait, what? There's <laughs> one that says that we're all called to make pain a friend, not our best friend, but a friend. But the reason he's sticking in my mind because he pinpointed some things that I do, I avoid discomfort. I distract myself. And I wonder how many of you are like me who avoid discomfort, distract yourself. Here are some ways you distract yourself. Mindlessly scrolling on social media. Binge watching another show on streaming services. I feel like every time I run out of one, they put another one up. I like, I guess I'll watch this one too. Maybe you're not a TV watcher. You find another book that you'll never finish. We look for different ways to distract ourselves. The reason why is because we keep taking our eyes off of what we're supposed to focus on. The one we're supposed to focus on. How is your focus today? Is it a little blurry? Is, is it time for a checkup for you to get your eyes clarified? How are you focusing on the Lord? 
Family, to know the power of Christ and his resurrection, we cannot avoid the discomforts in this life. We have to set our focus on Christ in everything. And everything that seems it will crush us, it actually becomes an opportunity when we focus on him for his grace to be displayed in our life. In our weakness, he is made strong. This is why we set our fo focus on him who gives us faith for this future joy, because discomfort is coming. It's a guarantee of life. I don't care if you, how long you've lived, if you never had a problem, don't worry, it's coming. As my, as my grandma used to say, just keep living, baby. Problems are coming. But when problems arise, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to show how he, he's faithful in all seasons of life. So when the finances seem to act strange, it's an opportunity to say, oh, but my God has supplied every need I have. When, when, when anxiety rises up, but wait, my God said, so I could cast my anxiety on him because he cares for me. When it feels like the world is against you, but God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It's an opportunity for us to boast in our confidence and focus back on him. That's why Paul can say so confidently in Romans. For I consider the suffering of this present time are not worthy compared with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Paul can say this because this is a man who has experienced pain. <clears throat> but despite experiencing pain, he never lost hope. His eyes were set on the right place. And when our eyes is set on the right place, it doesn't just affect our life. It actually galvanizes others around us. Look at verses 15 through 17 in the book of Philippians. He says, therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal it to reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. I'm going to pause right there because I get so excited when I think about it. This isn't just a message for the mature believer. This is for the novice and the expert. This is for the pastor on stage and the person in the pew. This is for the child and children's ministry and the leader of a denomination. This is for everybody. So there's never a time if you're in the body of Christ when you're saying, well, I can't do that. He said, no, no, you're called to galvanize others also. As I'm, he's galvanizing the church, he's also saying, and you also galvanize. Uh, I have a few friends. I was thinking of an illustration. I thought this was funny. I have a few friends a few years ago. Um, they were a part of this phenom that was taking place. I, I used to pick at them, called it a cult. They were a part of the cult of CrossFit. <laughs> And CrossFit was such an interesting phenom because it didn't matter if you had been there one time or you had been there a hundred times or you had made this a life experience. All of a sudden, they expected the novice and the expert to do the exact same thing. When the novice walked in, if they don't know what they're doing, they said, what do I do? Just jump in line. So-and-so is running ahead of you. They're going to lift weight. Just follow after them, jump in line, and go. But I don't know what to do. Don't worry. As you go, you'll grow. I wonder if we had the same mindset in the church. You might just have put your faith in Christ, but don't worry. You know enough to know that Jesus loves you. You might know, not know soteriology, meaning the, the doctrine of salvation, but you know, Jesus saved me. And now you can tell somebody else, Jesus saves. How does he save? I don't even know, but I'm going to tell you, he saved me. And he said, just trust him. So I'm just learning how to trust him. This is what Paul is calling the church to do. He's saying, imitate me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. Meaning, you imitate me, you jump in line, and you do exactly as I'm doing, and you expect somebody else to jump in line after you and do exactly as you do. It's a life of galvanizing others to imitate who are you modeling your walk after? Like, do you follow Jesus? Who do you look up to and say, man, I wish I followed Jesus like that. I prayed like that. I, I, as a pastor, I, I, I listen to a lot of sermons. I learn, listen to a lot of sermons. I look at a lot of churches. And I, I, I be encouraged sometimes, like, man, I wish I prayed like that. Sometimes I'm like, I'll never pray or preach like that. But as the Lord says, just go and grow. Just keep going. As you go, you will grow. 
Not only how are you, who are you imitating your life after, do you ever think about how people are imitating their life after yours? Like if you start thinking about who looks up to you and who is modeling this Christian walk off of yours, it'll start making you reevaluate how your Christian walk looks. It should. Like, like I just think about what Jesus says, you know, um, woe to those who leads one of these little ones astray. That's a, that's, a, whew, that's a powerful statement. That means if they're following after you and it leads them to go astray and live sinful, then Jesus is not going to just deal with them. He's going to come and deal with you. It should make you start to think, is your focus set right? Are you galvanizing others to follow the Lord in the ways that they should? Or are you playing with the Lord? Are you playing around? Now, remember, early in this chapter, Paul says it's not Jesus plus. Like, you're not saved because of what you do. You're saved because of the grace of God. But once you're saved, it should inform how you live your life, where your focus is, how you're galvanizing, how you're walking. It should inform everything. How are you walking these days? You know, as I think about the church, not just our church, just I always ask the question, Lord, what is the church supposed to be like? And I keep coming back to this simple reality of what the church was always to be. Our people centered on God's word together and joyfully communing together and just showing off God's glory together. Like, like, that's what the church has always been. Where do I get that from? Well, that's in the book of Acts. Right at the Holy Spirit fell. In, Ho in Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Spirit descended upon his disciples and he saved multitudes, the first thing they do is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together, held all things in common, they sold their possessions and property and distributed the, the proceeds as any had need, meaning everyone was taken care of. Everyone cared for each other. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate, and I love this word, their food with joyful and sincere hearts. And out of that joyful and sincere hearts, as they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all people every day, now, some days, every day, the Lord added to the number of those who are being saved. You know, as I meditate on what the church is supposed to live like to galvanize this gospel to go forth, I just keep coming back to the simple truth. It's supposed to be a joyful people who are centered around God's word and relationship with each other. Doesn't that sound like our values? You know, practicing presence, celebrate discipleship. Doesn't that sound like what we're trying to create here, this galvanize around? We just want to center our lives on God's word with one another, living joyfully and celebrating the good things that God is doing. That's why our values that way, because we are a galvanized people. We're always not just trying to reach the loss, but they're trying to live a life that's better than this world can ever offer. We're supposed to be an attractional church. And I don't mean that in the church growth model, bigger lights, better music, you know, do big shows, but attractional as in, man, they really love Jesus. And they have fallen deep in love with Jesus. And their eyes are set on Jesus. And they want to look more like Jesus, knowing they haven't perfectly reached the mark. You know, focused but yet knowing we're stumbling, but yet we're still calling others to follow. Focus, galvanizing. How does your life look like that? If you're living this life of focus and galvanizing, you also, the Lord should be softening your heart to live a life of compassion. Look at verse 18 and 19 for me in our text. Paul says, for I have told you, and now, Say again with tears that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. And they are focused on earthly things. 
you know, when I first read that, I was like, this don't sound compassionate. This sounds judgmental. You could easily read that judgment in it. But I think as I wrestled through this text, I'm noticing Paul has his focus actually on two different groups. So earlier we were talking about the Judaizers, but now we get here, I don't think he's talking about the Judaizers anymore. He's talking about anyone who's living a false life, not following after Christ. He's talking about the evil, sinful people whose desires are their own heart. It's the same type of people that the book of Jude warns us about in Jude 17 through 19. You friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told us in the end times they will be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are worldly, not having the spirit of God. So Paul's talking about these worldly, divisive scoffers of the gospel. Evil, wicked people. But then there's a strange tears in his eyes. Why would Paul be crying about the scoffer? Well, because I think it's the second group also. The second group are not the scoffers themselves, but those who are influ influenced by the scoffer. Jude chapter, I mean Jude verse 20 through 23, later on it says, but you dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. So this is for the believer. We have eternal life coming. We have a hope. <clears throat> have mercy on those who waver. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. Paul seems to be taking in the same thing that the brother of Jesus, Jude, was talking about. There is scoffers in this world. There are those who are on the path of destruction, and there's those who's following, who's being led astray. And this brings tears to Paul's eyes. He has compassion. I think the reason he has compassion is because he believes, eh, he believes that many of them don't even know what they're following. They're following a broken world and they're lost in darkness. As we focus on Jesus, our desires should become the same desires that Jesus has. As we galvanize others towards Jesus, our passion should be growing because we want more and more to know him. We should have the same cares that Jesus has. I don't, I don't think Jesus wants anyone lost. Actually, Jesus said himself. He says, I desire that no one would be lost. No, not one. He even proved this as he gave the parables of the hundred, shep hundred sheep, one walks away, he, the shepherd leaves the 99 to go get the one. Of the ten coins, lady loses one, she tears the house up to find the one. The two brothers, Jesus' value system is all should know. All should hear. Now, it brings up a dilemma, especially as a person who believes in predestination and all those things. And if you want to talk about Calvinism, Arminian, whatever. If Jesus desires all to be saved, why don't he just save all? Isn't that universalism? He just saves all because he decides? Well, no, no. Jesus desires, so what did he do? He empowered his people. Acts 1, he says, I will make you witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I will send my spirit to be amongst my people. And if my people are growing and putting their focus on me, they have compassion about the loss. We don't save nobody, but we tell everybody. It's the old gospel saying, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who will save anybody. Listen, we are called to tell everybody, hope, praying and hoping and putting our focus on him that he will save anybody. So the broken hardness should be growing in us to have this desire to see the loss saved. How does the Lord steer your heart for the loss? In what ways is he steering you up to put your focus on those who don't know? This is actually why this church is planted. We was planted out of burden because we saw a neighborhood that needed the gospel. But we didn't, weren't planted just 
to stop at seeing the gospel go forth in this neighborhood. We were planted with the hope and prayer that as we see the gospel go forth, it would produce in us such a fruit that we have to send people out to go and reach more and more and more from this neighborhood to the next neighborhood, to, to North Carolina, to Charlotte, whatever, to the ends of the earth. Because it's the compassion growing. This is why one of our values is that gracious justice. I told you, we're going to talk a lot about our values. And if you get sick of us talking about our values, that's okay. Get a brochure and you can read about our values. So you ain't got to hear us talking about it. But one of our values, gracious justice, on the surface, it looks like we're just talking about doing good works to bless the city. Gracious justice, we seek the welfare of our city by addressing holistic needs such as food, education, and vocational training. That, that sounds like just another nonprofit, right? But behind that, that holistic piece, is the gospel transforms us so much that it makes us step into every sphere. So if the Lord has given us access to the sphere of hunger, guess what? We want to give food, but also share gospel. It has given us the access into the education system. Guess what? We're going to show up like we do at J.P. Thomas, pray for the school, share the gospel, and fight against the brokenness of our educational system. If, if this community is so impoverished because of a lack of training for vocations, guess what? We want to put together vocational training, but it's for the hope that we can share the gospel as we equip the people for the work of ministry and in life. We should have a compassion. The gospel should be breaking us to have compassion for all those around us. How is the Lord steering you? Now, where does all this compassion come from? Where, where, how, how does this focus and this galvanizing and this compassion move us? Well, it moves us to look beyond this world because we're not of this world. Verse 20, as we move to our future hope, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await for a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, he will transform the body of our humble conditions into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. So then, my dear brother and sister, my longed for and loved brother and sister, my joy and crown in this manner stand firm in the Lord. Paul saying, as we lift up our head and focus on this hope that is coming, as we galvanize others to follow us towards this hope, as we have compassion on those around us, we remind ourselves of the future hope that our citizenship is in heaven where our Savior sits on a throne and has all power and will bring every government, every system under his feet and this world will be made new. A, a heavenly body, we will be transformed. This is this image of a glorified state. I want to let you know, everything we do here is always going to be broken. It's just going to be broken. As much as we are trying to get close to him, it's always going to have a level of brokenness. So we put every best system together trying to glorify God, and it's going to still have its flaws. But there's a day coming when all those flaws will be done away with. The, the pains and aches of our bodies will be done away with. The broken systems of this world will be done away with. Hunger will be done away with. There will be no need for the educational system of this world because we'll have access to eternal glory. This is being done away with. And we're being transformed. So Paul tells his brothers and his sisters, and I tell you, stand firm. Look to that day. How can we have confidence, this kind of confidence for tomorrow? Well, unlike any who didn't have a promise, we have a better promise. Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were, so, if it were not so, would I have told you that I was going to prepare a place for you? Yet if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. Family, Jesus might have left in the ascension, but he will return with a shout of victory. He is coming back. He is coming to wipe away all the dreary days, and we can now join in just like Annie says, and when I'm stuck with a day that's gray and lonely, 
I'm going to stick out my chin and grin and say, the sun is coming out tomorrow. Family, the sun is coming out, not just coming out, but he's coming back and everything will be made new. We know this because everything has been done away with, with his death, burial, his resurrection, but he didn't just defeat sin, but now he sits on the throne and he intercedes. So as we stumble, yeah, we may stumble, but he says, just focus on me. I keep bringing you closer. As we fight to move forward, he said, just focus on me. I keep bringing you closer. And as we trip along these hurdles of life, he said, just focus on me. I'll bring you closer. And as we get closer to him, we can turn around and say, hey, y'all, keep coming. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. And as we see those who are lost and far off, we can have compassion and say, hey, y'all could come too. Because I'm getting closer. We have a future hope. We have a promised hope. Is your faith in that promised hope today? Is your faith in the one who bled for you so that you may live with him? Or are you still distracting yourself, trying to avoid the issues of this world, thinking that you will bring joy yourself? You won't. But there is a future joy. Turn to him. And tomorrow will be a better day. Will you pray with me? Father, we sing cute songs. We laugh and joke. Yet we know that the hope you offer is promised. And I pray today that, Lord, you would lift our heads up. You would help us to go through our current circumstances because you sit on the throne. And every time we trip, you say, look back up. Oh, there you are. Lord, I pray today is for those who may be weary today that they would lift up their heads and they would be strengthened. For those who may not know you today that they would turn their eyes to you and say, oh, you're worth following. Lord, I pray that you would work in here today. That we would not be like an orphan without hope. And that we would be better than an orphan that has unrealistic hopes. But we will remember that we are children that have a promised hope. And that our eyes can be focused on you and you are bringing us to yourself. So, Lord, as we sing, remind us of our need for you today. Remind us of our joy in you today. And receive our worship on today. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand and continue?